Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Kathy Kayaza, and I am the Director of Career Curriculum Initiatives at the Gwenham Green Center for Career Education and Connections, as well as one of the co-chairs of the Genesee Staff Council. I will be moderating this afternoon's leadership update. Before we begin, I would like to share a few Zoom webinar tips to those who might be new to the platform. If you would like to ask our speakers a question, please submit it through the Q&A function that is located at the bottom of the screen. If you would like to view this session with closed captions, click CC on the bottom toolbar and select Turn on Subtitles. If you are having any trouble viewing the webinar, you can call in and listen using the phone number that was included in your confirmation email. We have around 2,400 participants joining us today. I wanna to thank you for taking the time to connect and come together as university staff from all parts of our institution, even if it is virtually, for this important conversation today. Welcome to each of you. Thank you also for submitting questions in advance. We received over 150 questions and have done our best to consolidate topics so we can get through as many of them as we can. We acknowledge that one hour is not nearly enough time to address the significant topics we will be discussing today, but we will do our best to cover as much as we can during our time together. And we'll also provide time at the end for live questions, as well as contact information should you have further questions after today's session. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce and welcome each of our panelists. Joining us today are Sarah C. Mangelsdorf, President and G. Robert Whitmer Jr. <laughs> University Professor, Mercedes Ramirez Fernandez, Vice President for Equity and Inclusion and Chief Diversity Officer, Tony Kinslow, Associate Vice President for Human Resources and Chief Human Resources Officer, and Kathy Gallucci, Vice President for Human Resources, University of Rochester Medical Center and Executive Director for Human Resources. Sarah, would you like to start us off with some introductory remarks? Yes, thank you, Kathy, for that excellent introduction and for your work with the Genesee Staff Council. We really appreciate it. Good afternoon, everyone. I know for some of you that scheduling of this event corresponds with your lunch break, so I sincerely thank you for giving us your time and attention today. We're going to do our best to get to the questions that we know are on your mind. First, let me say, I recognize that these are very difficult times for all of us. We are currently experiencing the stress of multiple crises from a pandemic to the financial crisis caused by the pandemic to the racism and social unrest in our society. We continue to live with uncertainty about the future while also having been deprived of so many of the things in our lives that bring us joy, such as dinners with friends and families, concerts, movies, family reunions, weddings, travel, and other things like that. To have so much stress without much joy is a very hard combination. However, I, for one, have been finding the beautiful Rochester summer weather and our wonderful parks and bike trails. And I hope you have too. The senior leadership team and I are working hard to plan our path forward. And we know that every single one of you is doing the same. Whether you are juggling working from home while caring for young children, or you're remodeling our classrooms for physical distancing, or you're developing new programs and protocols for when students return to campus, you are making a difference. By foregoing merit increases, by taking furloughs, and in some cases, salary reductions, you've also made a significant impact on our bottom line and on our financial recovery. I want you to know how much I appreciate your sacrifices. I sincerely wish we did not have to ask <coughs> of you, but as we all know, we are truly in unprecedented times. A number of you had wrote in with questions about furloughs. So I'll say a few things about furloughs. I want to stress that our intention was always to minimize the impact on staff 
rolled out the furlough program pretty quickly in April to take advantage of additional government funding through the CARES Act. In April and May, our staff filed over 6,200 claims for unemployment and received New York State unemployment. And those who received that New York State un unemployment also automatically qualified for the CARES Act money of $600 a week. We do not yet have the number of claims filed in June. I also want to emphasize that 85% of our staff who were furloughed were, or in, this, in some cases right now, are on partial furloughs. In other words, the majority of our staff are still working at least part-time. Some of you also wrote in with questions about retirement benefits. Um, so I thought I'd say a few things about that as well. Now, unlike many of our peers, including places like Boston University, Duke, Georgetown, Northwestern, Washington University, we chose not to eliminate all employer contributions to retirement. Instead, we were very purposeful in our efforts to maintain contributions for our lowest wage employees, those making less than 59,200. Our lowest paid staff will have no reductions in their retirement. For staff earning 75,000, the reduction in retirement is approximately a 1% cut in overall compensation. For those earning 100,000, it's approximately a 2% reduction, et cetera. So the higher the salary of the employee, the larger the percentage cut in overall compensation. In the case of our employees who typically take a summer <coughs> of the year, such as many of our dining service workers, we worked with their union to continue their medical benefits over the summer, which was not the case in earlier years. Many of you have asked whether our furlough program will continue beyond August 31st. I hope not. Our intention is to call everyone back to work full time on September 1st, but we can't say that for certain yet. And I wanna explain why. After losing $140 million in April alone at our medical center, operations at the medical center began to ramp up in May. And they continue to ramp up and clinical volumes are rebounding much more quickly than we anticipated. This is excellent news. Because of this, we have been able to recall 700 of the 34 people on furlough from the medical center. Another positive sign is that our deposits for fall enrollment, that is the deposits students or their parents put down indicating they plan to attend our university in the fall, those fall deposits are on par with prior years. But we are not out of the woods yet. The university's budget shortfall going into fiscal 21, which number begins on July 1st, is 184 million. With the recent decision to scale back retirement contributions for the year, we are saving an additional 60 million. But whether the students who submitted deposits will ultimately pay their tuition bills in August is quite frankly unknown. We are not only concerned with the prevalence of COVID-19 here in the Finger Lakes, where actually things seem to be fairly well under control, but we are tracking the increase in cases across the country and the prevalence of the disease around the world. Because as you all know, our students come from all over the country and all over the world. And our priority must always be the health and safety of our staff, faculty, and students. If all goes well, and I have my fingers crossed, we will have an on-campus residential experience this fall. Our Coronavirus University Restart Team has been working around the clock to prepare for students to return to our campuses. Today, we are submitting our plan to the governor, which we believe is in alignment with New York State guidelines. That's our reopening plan. This plan will shortly be available on the university's COVID-19 website. Now, while we certainly hope and expect to have students in residence, we know that some students will not return or come at all for that matter, perhaps because they are international students who are unable to get visas or cannot travel because of travel bans, 
or some students will decide not to come to university this fall because of COVID-19 or for personal reasons. Thus, we are preparing to provide in-person and online teaching. The university has opened up all of its research programs and is gradually opening its administrative functions. Many of us continue to work remotely or go into our office briefly and then come back to Zoom from home. I know very well how tiring it can be to spend hours in back-to-back -back Zoom meetings or sifting through countless emails. But I also know that some staff have concerns about returning to the office. I can assure you we are working on guidelines for everything from the centralized purchasing of PPE, personal protective equipment, to how we clean and disinfect all our facilities. When we do return to the office, we will have to participate in daily health screenings using Dr. Chatbot. I've already been doing that. I recommend you all sign up and our students will too. I wanna to give special thanks to everyone on the Restart team especially the co-chairs, Jane Gatewood and Mark Cavanaugh. The work they and the rest of their team have done is incredibly complex, and I'm very appreciative of their time and incredible dedication. <clears throat> Thanks also to all of you on th this meeting, and there are a lot of you. I found it really quite daunting that there'd be 2,400 people on this webinar. Um, I remember when I was announced as president to the incoming president of, of this university it was in December of 2018, I came to Rochester. And in my remarks, I talked about how universities couldn't function without their staff and how important the staff are to the working of the university. And I meant that this university would not be what, what it is without all of you and your hard work. And I'm only sorry that our way of thanking you this year is by giving you a furlough, perhaps a salary cut, and or a retirement contribution reduction. I know that none of that has made you feel appreciated or made you feel that the administration cares about you. And for that, I am very, very sorry. Never in my wildest dreams would I have imagined that in my first year as president, I would be furloughing people, cutting salaries, and reducing people's retirement contributions. This is not what any president would ever <clears throat> do, and certainly not a new president in her first year. I very much hope that in the coming years, I will be able to make it up to you. With that, let's move on to your specific questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, as we dive into our first questions, uh, actually the, the first uh, will bounce off <laughs> ideas that you just spoke to. So the first one being, can you elaborate a little bit more on how you hope that some of the measures that have been taken over the past few months, such as furloughs and retirement reductions, will help protect staff in the future and the overall health of the institution in our community? Well, it was our goal that by doing some of the cost expense reductions this spring, that we could protect ourselves going forward and be, a, be in a stronger place financially. But at the time we were losing the largest sums of money in the medical center, we were really concerned. We need to make sure we can make payroll. And um, our government officials in DC pointed out that the CARES Act funding was there to help us because if we couldn't cover all expenses, all our expenses in terms of payroll, the, Act, the CARES Act funds was there to help with that. Um, we, we do think we're already in a better place than we were, given that the medical center clinical revenues are ramping back up. But all the expense reductions we did, whether reducing um, on, you know, restricting travel, reducing all kinds of expenditures around, uh, across the university, having all the senior administrators around the campus take salary reductions and so forth. We think they're all part of the cost <clears throat> that are needed to assure our future. 
Thank you so much. So with that respect, we did receive questions from a number of people who wanted to know about how faculty cuts were handled compared to those for staff. There is a perception that exists that staff and faculty were not treated equitably in the process. Can you discuss this from your vantage point? Well, yeah, that's why I stress the, the way we cut um, the retirement is actually designed to be uh, progressive rather than regressive. So it protects the, the less money you earn, the lower your cuts are. And so um, there are no faculty, all faculty are getting their retirement contributions cut, but there are quite a few staff who are not getting any cut at all. And that was, that was intentional, that we, the lowest wage earners would be protected. Um, but, but it is true, um, faculty were not furloughed. Um, but it is the case that in some instances, not all instances, but in many instances, for example, the individuals furloughed from the medical center, in many cases it was because the outpatient clinics we had were closed. Their, their jobs weren't there. There wasn't work to be done. Um, and our faculty were in fact continuing to teach throughout the spring semester and to do, it was on Zoom, but they were still doing their teaching and research. Our next question is for Mercedes. I'll pass it over to you, Mercedes. This has been a challenging time for our community and our country given the current racial tensions. As you've been meeting with staff, as well as other members of the university community and the greater Rochester community, what have you been hearing and how is that informing the ways that you are thinking about a broader university-wide approach to addressing systemic issues that directly impact our employees who are black, indigenous, and people of color? Thank you very much, Kathy. Um, it's, it's wonderful to be here. I appreciate the opportunity to address this question and others. Um, I have been hearing um, a lot of pain, a lot of anger, um, a lot of frustration, you know, from um, staff and from students and across um, people from the community. Um, some of the issues that have been addressed um, are issues around climate and um, um, unconscious or explicit bias, uh, microaggressions, um, inequities and bias um, around uh, university policies. Um, and um, from um, a fairly strong group of, uh, of individuals at the university that uh, they felt that they have been talking, you know, to the leadership of the institution or, or to their supervisors, you know, to address these issues. And um, that they felt that there has been very little movement. And so at this point, there's this um, unrest and just uh, this demand for very rapid action. We see that in uh, not only here at the University of Rochester, but you know, in the country um, as, as, as uh, systems of oppression and you know, racism, anti-blackness um, has gotten us into, into a, a space of um, you know, very immediate action. So I have um, appreciated the honesty and the, the candor that uh, the staff, uh, frontline employees, uh, employee resource groups and others that I have met with, um, how they have conveyed that you know, to me and uh, to um, the uh, staff at the Office of Equity and, and, and Inclusion. So um, it, another, part, another part has been um, a matter around education and uh, orientation of our um, community members around what, what would the University of, of Rochester look as an anti-racist community and the work that we need to do to get there. So I feel that um, we are in a very good position now to address that and to develop, you know, systems and um, a curriculum to address um, to address that particular issue. So we're taking all of that into consideration. We're uh, striving to, you know, become 
um, um, a more um, actualized anti-racist institution and also other systems of oppression. Um, thinking about centralizing um, bias related incident um, processes, um, working on building pipeline programs or strengthening the ones that we have. Uh, working with department chairs and uh, heads of departments and administrative units on developing reports around diversity, equity, and inclusion and, and have actionable plans. Uh, those are some of the things that, you know, have been occupying every single ounce of my brain in the last, you know, several weeks. Thank you, Mercedes. You're welcome. Um, Sarah, are there additional steps that we're taking right now um, that you could elaborate on? in regards to these issues? Well, Mercedes and I have been um, meeting almost daily with, with different groups of faculty, staff, and, and students. On Friday afternoon, we met with a group of students um, who share their concerns about our campus climate. And all of them have suggestions of things that we, we should change. Um, one of the the ones that comes up on a lot of their lists is this um, bias response reporting and a lack of a centralized, like you can do it through ASE or you can do it through the Med Center, but maybe there should be one central portal where all such complaints could come, regardless of whether you're a student, staff, or faculty member, and then they could be behind the scenes, we could triage them to whichever unit needed to follow up. Um, but just make it clearer and easier so people know we did a lot of, our university did a lot of work on enhancing um, the website for what you need to do for Title IX reporting, but it's not as clear for the bias reporting. We need to do something comparable. So you could just one stop, here's where you file your, your concern or complaint. So we've heard that one loud and clear. We've also heard um, particularly from the students, but also from faculty about the importance of hiring a new director for the Frederick Douglass Institute. And I know this is something that um, Dean Culver in ASNE is very committed to. And um, then there is much discussion also among faculty um, and students about the, the status of the institute and whether it should be a department and all those kinds of things, which the faculty will need need to work on. Mercedes and I are very supportive of that, but that would be something that the faculty of ASNE would need to work on. Um, of course, there are major concerns, and we share these concerns, about the, um, the diversity of our faculty on campus and the diversity of our senior administration. Um, our, our faculty, we do have a diverse staff, but not amongst the higher ranks of staff and we see that and we're working on that and we, we know it's a relevant concern and many of our students of color have said they never had a course taught by faculty member of color. That's a problem. We see it as a problem um, and we're, you know, we're committed to working on it. Um, so those are some of the things. There, there are many other issues about ways we could perhaps um, be more connected with um, black owned businesses in the community, both for everything from catering contracts for, and for other procurement of other you know, products, goods and services. And th those are, that's something else we'll be looking at and working on. Thank you, Sarah. And, and we're, gonna, we're gonna take a little bit of time here to continue on this topic a little bit. Mercedes, I'm gonna pass a, the next question over to you. But first, um, Sarah, could you speak to the campaign um, that was recently announced the Together for Rochester and how that addresses this topic as well. Thank you. you, you you've um, reminded me of something that I should have remembered. We're, we're launching a special campaign as of July 1st that's um, Together for Rochester, a one-year campaign focused on a number of things, but one of them is on diversity-related um, Topic. So funding, if people want to help us fund faculty lines, help us fund lecture series, help us fund scholarships, we're all over it, we would love it. We'll also be at some, some people will also be committing funds and already have to support COVID related research. And then there will also be uh, emphasis on helping our recent graduates 
find internships because you know the class of 20 and probably the class of 21 as well will struggle in job placements and our whole university of rochester family that means all of us and all the alums out there need to help us with that uh, to help them get, help our students and recent grads get the best possible opportunities they can thank you sarah so mercedes i i want to make sure um, with this next question that we're really focusing today's um, responses on our staff who are listening live as well as uh, we'll be viewing the recording in the future. So could you speak to how your team is thinking about pathways or programs that can help our underrepresented staff connect with mentors, develop skills, and find those pathways that we talked about towards advancement? Yes, you know, Kathy, um, I think, you know, uh, when we're talking about diversifying our staff is how, how do we think, you know, in very deliberate and, you know, and, and, and purposeful ways on, on, on developing the, the human capital of our underrepresented staff. So something that I have been, you know, thinking very deeply is on how do we do individualize, you know, plans for um, career progression for our staff. Um, we have some pretty amazing programs um, that work on coach, coaching and mentorship um, of underrepresented staff that are working in um, being underemployed, you know, for the qualification for the qualifications that they have. But one of the things that you know comes to me, um, and I remember this. Uh, from um, my first visit here at the University of Rochester when I met both, you know, Kathy and Tony, uh, was in how to apply this concept that we work with our students in um, to our staff. And uh, the partnership that um, I have, I'm very lucky to have this very strong partnership with Human Resources, with Tony and Kathy and others, is to to think about this systems, you know, and how to, uh, how to implement those, those uh, programs that will take into consideration, you know, our staff uh, talents and skills and also passions. Um, so one of the things that we were um, talking of, um, in our OEI team um, was a, um, a Women of Color Leadership Academy. And this is something that I was very fortunate to participate when I was in, in, in something similar at the University of Illinois. And that really provided me with uh, developing my own strategic plan and doing that in a community of women of color. So um, being in contact and communication with EAP and, and, and some um, pretty fantastic people that we have in, in, that, um, in that office uh, to think about how to collaborate. So for me, it's also like how to, how to connect the dots. You know, So we have people in our organization that are not, um, that are not grouped within um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, but that are doing the work. You know, so part of the part of the thinking and uh, strategizing since this past uh, summer has been on how do we collect all of these people to be able to create that plan and those programs in support of our uh, staff of color. I also know that you know probably Tony will speak about this. You know that he has a. A learning and development, you know, a development um, a director in uh, the HR organization, and uh, and that is just part of the vision that he's had in HR, and that we both uh, share in this particular, um, you know, in this particular situation. Yeah. Thank you, Mercedes. Thank you. Um, so, for both you and Sarah, having experience from other universities that have had successful initiatives like the one you just mentioned. Um, are there other programs that we could initiate here at the University of Rochester? You want me to go first or do you want to go first? <laughs> okay. Uh, so I think one of the things is about developing an infrastructure to be able to do the work. And these are the conversations that I've been having with Sarah and some of uh, our uh, colleagues in senior leadership, but you know, across the university. So you need to be able to have that infrastructure in order to be able to kind of like lift the work, you know. So one of them was what uh, what Sarah alluded to earlier about having this centralized um, uh, portal or this hub where we can actually place a lot of the information around uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, resources, 
And at this time, where we're all still socially distanced, and even though we are hoping for a very robust and uh, meaningful fall semester with um, our students returning, there will still be a considerable amount of you know, distanced employees and staff and faculty that uh, will have to continue given, given um, the unpredictability of you know, COVID-19 and, and wanting to make sure that we are uh, keeping our institutions safe. Um, that is like one of the major priorities of our office uh, so that um, so we we know what others are doing there's a lot of really good work that is happening here at the university but we don't know about it so how do we lift the um, work of uh, staff the work of our students that are in support of our staff that's amazing to see uh, that's that's one of the uh, um, one of the things that come to mind, and then this organizing around you know social identity groups in a strategic way, um, in a way that we can have priorities and we work in concert with everybody in the organization. So I come from like a kind of grassroots environment, you know, so that it's going to take all of us doing this work, and hopefully not in direct or antagonistic. Um, partnership, but, you know, and really with the true spirit of wanting to, in the true spirit of the university's motto, in the, you know, in, in the Meliora spirit. Um, those are, those are two things that are on my mind around, around, around staff. I, I could add, um, elaborate on one of um, Mercedes' comments and then mention one other, which I think Tony and Kathy would probably elaborate on further. One is, um, one observation I think both Mercedes and I have had, having been at other institutions, is that our university organization is much more siloed across the schools than some other um, institutions. And so for good or for bad, we don't always know. We don't know about good things that are happening in different places. We don't know about bad things necessarily either. It's not as coordinated. Um, to the center uh, as other places we've been. And we're trying to work on that. And I know that you know, there's, there's, we're trying to do more crosstalk across all units so that the sharing of information so we can share best practices and we can share lessons learned. Um, and then another thing that I would say in contrast to something I think we need to work on and we've already started working on it is I don't quite understand when I came here I realized that I didn't quite understand our job titling um, and our job grades. Like some of it just didn't make sense to me, like how you get from grade 52 to 53 or what it even means. Um, and no one could really explain it to me, which suggests maybe we need to change it. Um, and if I don't understand it, and I bet there are lots of staff who don't understand it, who'd like to say, you know, I'd love to spend my whole career at University of Rochester, but will I always be a grade 52 or whatever? I mean, are there opportunities for advancement? Um, and I, I think there need to be some places, some call them job ladders. Um, like, so if you're in a certain area, you can start at a certain level. And if you perform well and you want to take on new challenges, you can advance to another level and so forth. Um, that's possible here, but it's certainly not easy to navigate. And so that's something we're going to be working on is really studying and redoing and revamping our HR system, our titles, job descriptions and titles and job families. And because um, I don't think Tony can um, and Kathy can uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think it's been upgraded, updated here since the 1970s, maybe. So that suggests that maybe like things like web designers, that probably wasn't even a job description in the 1970s. So the world has changed and so should our job titles and show, and they should be designed in such a way that people can see, see the possibility of advancement with our, in our institution and we, could, we should help them that way. Great, thank you so much, Sarah. And, and you bring up a, a couple of issues that um, I wanna make sure and I've written down that we come back to um, at the end to address. Um, communication is one of them. And I, I think you've identified that the decentralization of our institution makes it very challenging to coordinate, um, centralize that communication so that it, it, it gets everywhere it needs to go um, to everybody um, mm -hmm. employed at the university. 
and then as well as the the restructuring and the relooking at our our salary grades and job descriptions and so forth. So I've made a note to come back to that, um, but I do want to do a time check and recognize um, we're gonna we're gonna shift to the second part of our our session here, which is to discuss return to work. Um, so I'm gonna do a, a pivot over to Tony. Um, Tony, this has been a challenging time for staff. Um, and as we talked about already, there is a lot of fear and concern about the future. Can you tell us if you expect there to be any more furloughs this year, or if you think that there will potentially be layoffs in the future? Thank you so much, Kathy. And I'm really pleased to be with you all today, um, particularly this, this leadership group. And Kathy, I wanna also mention the leadership you've been showing with the Genesee Staff Council that is still just nine months old, but is really making some, some moves at at helping us understand the needs and, and giving some more voice to the staff. Uh, the thing that I would say about the question is that I, I'm a very optimistic person and I think I have reason to be. And the reason I have uh, to be optimistic is that despite all the financial issues that Sarah talked about earlier, this institution has taken the care of its uh, most vulnerable population, uh, the, employee, the employees that are paid hourly wages and maybe some that are just above that in the consideration in every decision that is made. And, um, and because of that, I believe that as soon as we can return employees from furlough, that we will do so. And, you know, there are no guarantees right now, but I'm, I really do believe that because of some of the um, the steps that, that we've taken and that illustrates the fact that, that this institution uh, and its leadership under Sarah will make every, make every opportunity to get people back to work as quickly as possible and to avoid future furlough or layoff. It's unfortunate. Um, it's one of those things that we really um, hate that this that was a part of what was necessary uh, we tried to, again, take into consideration the fact that the CARES Act would help uh, with that situation, but it still doesn't leave anybody with a good feeling for having to do that or and that our employees have to endure that. I've heard people ask, well, uh, you know, what's the morale of, of the employees? And, you know, I think that at this point in time, it can't be fantastic because of all that we have gone through. And, but again, um, there are some illustrations that really point out what it is that this institution stands for, for its employees in the hourly wage levels. And that is things like just in that first month of crisis, uh, paying people for at least a month who, whether they could work or not. It includes um, no lapses in benefit coverage for our employees who are either laid off or on furlough. Um, really uh, avoiding um, the regressive nature of taking away all of the retirement payout, which, which would have really hit our lower paid employees um, in a way that I'm just proud of this institution that we didn't go that direction. Although as Sarah mentioned, several of other institutions uh, did completely eliminate their payouts. The information, the classes that have taken, that we've instituted to try and help people apply, the, the website that I want to make sure that you look at if you have additional questions, the COVID-19 website and how that is uh, set up to assist our folks. And, and other policy updates that we're working on to return people safely to work uh, are all the kind of things that I think speak volumes to the care uh, that this institution is, is attempting to take. Now we don't have, we, can't, we don't get everything right, but, but I am, um, I'm really proud of what this institution has done uh, to try and both close a significant financial gap and, and then be working 
consistently and constantly at what we need to do to get people back to work. And I'll stop there for just a moment. Thank you, Tony. I, I'm jumping ahead to, to a question here um, because it's been brought up a couple of times now about including staff voice at the table when decisions are made. Um, can you share with our viewers, viewers, you and I have talked about this topic at, at quite, quite length. Um, can you share with our viewers what is being done to ensure that staff voice is represented at the table when these decisions are being made? Yes, and you know, um, certainly we're growing in that area, as you know, Kathy, but you know, the Genesee Staff Council is a group that we have, uh, that we're working with, Mercedes and I uh, meet with you and your co-chair, Mark, uh, every other week. The, um, some of the, the suggestions that have come out of that council, we have begun immediately working on. Uh, of course, there's, as Mercedes mentioned, there are other um, uh, groups around campus that were what some people call as affinity groups, we call as university resource groups, uh, to also, and, and they're welcome to also provide their voice, whether it is the Emerging Leaders Group, the Latinx Group, the uh, um, uh, Women of Color Professionals, uh, and, and others, and we're open to hearing from from them as well and, and look forward to uh, a continued growth in the voice of our, our employees because we want people to let us know what we can do better. That is, a, I mean, that's, that's just, an, we're not afraid to hear from our people about how we can improve. Thank you, Tony. Kathy, we're gonna come over to you now. Um, looking ahead, can you give us a view into what the fall will look like for our employees. I know this is this is potentially different at the medical center versus other areas of our campus and university. Um, could you speak to when we expect expect staff working remotely to return, and what specific safety protocols are being put into place? Sure. Um, thank you so much for having me here today. Um, in terms of um, returning from remote work, I want to say. First and foremost, the health and safety of our staff is of the utmost important to us. And the president and Tony both referenced that there's been a lot of work done um, by a, a number of people really to coordinate and make sure that we're providing a safe and, and healthy environment. And so um, we certainly have a safe redesign team. That team is working to put structure and consistent materials together so that we have a standardized approach in terms of how we're looking at workspaces and making sure that we have protocols and things in place for people to really have um, um, a sense of security as they return to the, to the work environment. And part of that is really making sure that we also have uh, visual cues so that um, when we are thinking about social distancing and I'm coming back to my office space, I understand that what used to be maybe um, a place where a conference room where we had perhaps uh, 15 people before it's now a conference room that can only accommodate five people. And that's very, um, that's very something that's very visual and that people get right away and that they understand the space around individuals to make sure that we're, we're keeping proper social distancing. So that's really important. We want people to see and, and feel a consistent approach to their safety. So I think that that's been very important. The president mentioned Dr. Chatbot. That's something that we're already doing at the medical center. Um, and that's something that we'll ask all of our employees um, coming back to do on a daily basis. It's a health screening assessment. Um, not only are we using it here, we're using it at other um, organizations. And that was actually developed um, at the University Health Lab. And so we're, we're very proud of the work that they did to put that together. Um, so certainly um, when we look at remote work, there's also a team that is assessing how is it going? How is it going right now for our employees who are working remotely? Um, we'll, be, we'll be sending out some information, asking for feedback. We want to hear about um, the experience that people are having. We want to hear what's good. We want to hear what needs improvement. And we want to make sure that um, if there's opportunity even for some individuals to continue working remotely, 
um, even after the pandemic is over, we want to understand that too. Um, we really want to make sure that we have a flexible work environment and that our, our leaders are considering the needs of our employees as we work through what the fall will look like. Certainly, um, I know top of mind, lots of feedback about what's going to happen with schools and, and will will um, not only at the university, but at the at the elementary and, and grade and high school levels, really understanding what's going to happen that has an impact on our workforce. And we want to make sure that we understand it and we provide as much support and flexibility as we possibly can. Great. Thank you, Kathy. And, and that actually addressed one of my next questions, which was to the effect of uh, the potential for flexibility for remote work as we as we move forward. So I appreciate you sharing that. Um, I, I did want to ask about testing for students. So um, can you share about the testing that is anticipated to be done? Um, is this planned for all students who are returning and coming to campus? And then will there be continued random testing of students over the course of the semester? Student plan, as I understand it, you can, um, as I mentioned, later today, you should be able to go to, go to our COVID-19 website and look at the reopening plan, plan, and it discusses this, that all students um, will be tested um, when they either, before they get here, right before they get here, or when they get here. And then after that, they will just be using the um, <coughs> Mr. Chatbot feature. We will all be doing that. Um, because our public health experts uh, believe it's better to do symptom tracking than to just keep repeatedly testing lots of mostly asymptomatic people. Um, and then anyone who does manifest symptoms, of course, will test them and, and isolate them. If they test positive, of course, they will be um, isolated for a longer period. Um, but it is not, we're not going to be doing random testing throughout the that wasn't advised by our public health experts. The yeah. only thing I would say, and this is not about the students, but for the staff, uh, you know, there was some information published on at Rochester this morning that talked about people traveling to certain states and yeah. returning to the University of Rochester and, and the need to be tested within 24 hours if you travel to one of the, the states that Governor of New York mentioned. So. If you didn't see that information, it will be posted on our website as well. Please look at that. We have a holiday weekend coming up. I want everybody to be safe and, and aware. And I know that we're gonna run out of time to talk about much of that, but I, I, uh, I think that it's important that as we, uh, people get ready to do some travel possibly over the 4th of July that I just mentioned that, that uh, it comes with, for certain states, there are some things you need to know. And similarly, students from those states will need to be quarantined for two weeks when they arrive. Um, and but we don't know whether that list of states that we have now from the governor in June will be the same because COVID is a moving target. And um, right now, the, the states that he targeted are the states with the the fastest rate of increase in COVID cases. So I believe that list includes South Carolina, North Carolina, Florida, Arizona, Utah, help me, there's another one. Arkansas. Um, Arkansas, but that could change. So in other words, one of those could go down and, and another state could pop up as a hot spot. So we'll just keep monitoring that. I mean, I did ask the provost, well, how many students do we have from, from those states? And he said 250 in this first year class. I'm like, okay, but we don't know whether that will be the same list of states that will need to um, monitor and quarantine, you know, a month. We, we left out Florida, if that's in your plans. Florida's escalating very, very quickly, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. So we're, we're right around 12.50, so I do want to leave time for our live Q&A here. Um, the, the first question that I, I want to ask um, is related to the hiring freeze. Tony, um, is that still in place? And um, if so, at what point do you foresee that potentially lifting? So the hiring freeze is still in place with the exception of really uh, critical positions or essential positions. And, there, and essential positions are more than just those positions at the medical center. But, but in order to, and so it, 
it's not a complete freeze. If there is a position that's really needed, a person can go to their uh, dean or division director and and get, get permission to do to hire for a critical a position of critical need. I think that that will probably go on for the next few months. Unfortunately, I think that it will be um, uh, even with our uh, current board, we had only given a budget for the first quarter of the new year because of the financial situation. And we will have to reevaluate that in this probably in the second quarter of this new year, which is after September. Anything I miss on that, Sarah? Well, I think you've got that right. Um, I think at this point, there are just too many uncertainties. Like we said, we're, we're waiting, fingers crossed, to see whether, you know, we're going to bill people for tuition in July. Do we see them paying it in August? Time will tell, right? Um, and then we'll continue to watch those clinical revenues um, at the medical center, and hopefully they'll continue on that upward trajectory they've been on, which would be fabulous, as long as we don't have another, um, another surge, right? Uh, where we then have to clear out the hospital and focus on COVID patients and all of that um, and shut down. We, we don't want to do that. So we want to, there are a lot of things we don't know. Um, and because of that, it, it doesn't make sense to be bringing new people on board. Our focus should be first and foremost in, in protecting and paying our current staff and, and faculty who are already here. Um, but that there are, of course, exceptions. So if, if Kathy wants to, needs to hire nurses in a certain unit at the medical center, we bet, you better believe she's going to be able to hire those nurses in certain groups critical areas of the medical center, and there are other areas around the university that would similarly fall into that essential category. Tony, a, a follow-up for you. Have we received any update regarding the CARES Act funding? Do we anticipate there being any continuation uh, or extension of these? Unfortunately, at this point, we don't see that, there, that it will be extended. What we're getting from our legislative delegation is that um, there are folks who believe that it is a disincentive to people coming back to work. Uh, I don't happen to believe that. I believe people are, are honored to uh, spend their time being productive at something. So, um, but, but at this point, we have not gotten an indication that it will be extended. And that, I think that's unfortunate. Yeah, very unfortunate. Thank you. So I, I want to jump back to one of the questions that I, I had written down earlier. And um, Sarah, you had talked about really the commitment from the university to address um, the very challenging nature of outdated pay grades and job titles um, and, and wages. And, and whether Sarah or Tony would like to speak to this, um, can you speak to how you anticipate addressing, um, addressing this very large issue in a time frame when we're very financially strained, how how do how can we best address that? Well, um, we are in this current situation. One of the things that came up, and I I, I, I want Sarah and Kathy to and, and Mercedes to chime in here as well if we have time. So I'll try to make this brief. But one of the things that came up was that because we don't we don't have an updated uh, job and classification system it's hard for us to see how to build career ladders for people. It's hard for us to address the, uh, some inequities in our pay structure. It's difficult for us to, to let people know just how uh, we uh, associate the skills that they have with the kind of work they can do and, and make sure that they understand the rewards for doing that with the University of Rochester. So, so a lot will come out of this that will help advance the, all of the other things that we're trying to accomplish here in terms of attracting the right people uh, and retaining them and engaging them. And fortunately, the senior leadership of the university has seen it as important enough that they are allowing us to proceed with this process despite some of the financial difficulties that we're currently having because of just how important it is that we, when we do come out of this, that we come out of this better able to address those issues for our folks. Thank you, Tony. Um, Sarah, 
do you anticipate beyond the furloughs any potential future cuts? I know, I know that's not the hope, but do you anticipate the need for them? Or hope not. I mean, like Tony, you know, Tony and I are optimistic. We hope a lot of the indicators we have, whether it be the decrease in number of COVID cases, the increase of our clinical revenues and all of those things as optimistic signs and the generosity of our alumni and friends who have been giving um, philanthropically to the university despite um, it being a financially uncertain time. Usually philanthropic giving is down during an economic crisis and it has been down a little bit but you I've been very impressed with the generosity of our alumni and friends. And so I feel like we have a lot of things um, going for us. And I'm, I'm, I really hope that it all continues in um, a positive direction. As I often say, and I have said this whole spring, I don't, I don't have a crystal ball. Um, people want certainty that I can't give them. I would like certainty. Um, in fact, it's very strange to go to your board of trustees and say, we can't give you our budget for fiscal year 21 because we have no idea what it will be. Um, so we, we proposed a budget for the first quarter and then we'll be going back and uh, hopefully we'll be getting more certainty in the months to come because that will be a great comfort um, to all of us. Of course. Thank you, Sarah. Um, we're just wrapping up the hour here. Do you have any uh, quick final remarks to offer our viewers? Well, I just want to thank everybody both tuning in today and also for the work they do for our university. And once again, I do want to say how sorry I am that we've all been going through such a difficult time. And I, I know that many of our staff have borne the brunt of that, and I'm very sorry. So I, I'm, I'm hoping for uh, sunny skies and better times ahead. But, and I look forward to seeing you in person someday. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. And thank you to all of our panelists. We covered a lot of ground today, um, and we look forward to continuing these important conversations and working on them together moving forward. I also wanna take a moment to thank all of you, Sarah, um, Mercedes, Kathy, Tony, um, for all of the hard work that you've been putting in over these past few months um, uh, for the benefit of our institution. I wanna say a special thank you to our frontline workers during this time and truly to all of our staff um, who make up such a significant and important part of our university community. Thank you to everyone who joined us today and for submitting your questions. We will have a recording of this program available and posted in the next few days, including a transcript. If we were unable to answer a specific question you submitted, please do reach out to the Office of Human Resources or the Office of Equity and Inclusion, depending on the nature of your question, for further information and resources. We will be in touch soon about future leadership updates. Thank you, continue to stay health and safe, healthy and safe, and have a great afternoon.